If you think it's time to take a hammer to your bathroom scale and rip up the diet rule book, well, welcome to Body Kindness. Hi, everyone. It's Rebecca Scritchfield, author of Body Kindness and host for this podcast. I'm a health at every size dietitian, a certified exercise physiologist, a former chronic dieter, and mom to two girls. Join me as I talk to guests about what it means to be good to ourselves and create a better life where well-being matters, not weight. Through these conversations, we'll reveal the challenging and surprising ways our culture keeps us searching for our worth and our appearance. So let's create a new view of health that's inclusive and built on compassion and respect for all bodies. Let's shake things up and let's change the game. Hey listeners, would you like to help advance research on body image healing? I'm co-investigator of a new study with Dr. Jennifer Webb, director of the Integrative Positive Psychology Research Lab in Mindfulness, Body Acceptance, Culture, and Health at UNC Charlotte. And we're looking for body kindness readers living in the U.S. to participate in a survey. If you're a woman who's currently pregnant or with at least one child under five, and you are reading or have recently read Body Kindness, we would love to hear from you. Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash research to learn more. Those who complete the survey will be eligible to receive access to an exclusive web-based body kindness training with downloadable resources for pregnant and postpartum women developed by me. Please help us spread the word about the research study by sharing the link on social media. That's bodykindnessbook.com slash research. And if you haven't yet read Body Kindness, there are a limited number of free ebook copies available. Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash research. If you have any questions, please email me, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. So when an expert is saying this, you know, I'm the expert, I went to medical school, I have my white coat, you know, um, it is very difficult to sort of push back when they're saying, you know, nothing's wrong and to really trust yourself instead of the expert. And so I, yeah, I do hope that one of the things the book can do is just sort of by providing this context and history and and the data kind of empower people to, um, do what is a very hard thing to do to, to sort of push back in that setting. That was Maya Dusenberry. Maya is a journalist, editor of the feminist site, feministing.com, and author of the book, Doing Harm, The Truth About How Bad Medicine and Lazy Science Leave Women Dismissed, Misdiagnosed, and Sick. And we spend pretty much all the conversation today talking about her book and some of the interesting um, things she found. A lot of it was actually very surprising to me as someone who you know, knock on wood somewhere. I have um, been mostly healthy throughout my life. I haven't had many difficulties. And that's not the case for many women. And it turns out that we have a history of ignoring women's pain and believing women. And um, it has cost some women their lives. And for this focus on women's health, I really wanted to bring your awareness to these issues. And if you're someone who has suffered from pain or any of these other issues we've discussed, and you found help from listening to this podcast, I would love it if you just took a minute to send me an email and let me know. So it's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. So more about Maya. She has been a fellow at Mother Jones Magazine and a columnist at Pacific Standard Magazine. Her work has also appeared in publications like cosmopolitan.com, HuffPost, and theatlantic.com, plus Bitch Magazine, Teen Vogue, New York Post, as well as the anthology, The Feminist Utopia Project. Before becoming a full-time writer, she worked at the National Institute for Reproductive Health. I really hope you get a lot out of our conversation today. And if you're inspired, I would definitely check out her book, Doing Harm. Maya, welcome to Body Kindness. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I'm so excited for you to be joining me in this women's health series. And yeah, I discovered your book, which is called Doing Harm, The Truth About How Bad Medicine and Lazy Science Leave Women Dismissed, Misdiagnosed, and Sick. I discovered your book through the Cosmopolitan article that I read about somebody you talk about in the book whose name is she's also a Rebecca. Um, <laughs> and and I was I was floored to read her story and I thought I've got to read the book and I've got to have you on. So thank you so much for being here. 
um, and, and sharing all your wisdom. I finished the book. You have a lot of wisdom to share and a lot of um, information that I think listeners, some will be surprised and others will, I think they'll have their own sort of me too moment in the sense of like, I thought I was alone. So yeah. So let's just kind of start by letting listeners know a little bit more about you and your background and and how you came to write about this topic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my background is as a feminist writer and I have a background in reproductive health advocacy. So I'd always sort of been thinking about women's health sort of through that lens. And it wasn't until about five years ago when I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis that I started sort of broadening my my view of medicine and sort of starting to think about how gender bias and sexism might be affecting care more broadly. And really, really realized once I did get sick and and you know, my own experience getting diagnosed was pretty straightforward. But after I was diagnosed, I started learning a lot about autoimmune diseases and and realizing how common they are among women and also how many patients, unlike me, have these really long diagnostic delays and feel like during that time when they're seeing multiple doctors over multiple years, they're really sort of being not taken seriously and dismissed as chronic complainers. Um, And so that was the kind of first impetus to kind of just start thinking about these issues. And and what happened was basically once I started tuning in, I started hearing just informally in my networks and and friend groups of, of so many stories like that with women with a range of conditions who also felt like their symptoms were really brushed off and, and dismissed as all in their heads. Yes. And hysteria. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> it goes all the way back to, I mean, just some of the words when I was reading. And what's interesting about it through the read, I mean, I have to say it's a very, it is very, you're going to get great history and, inf- and information blended in with storytelling, which is, it may, for such a difficult topic to hear about, it makes it, I guess, like wonderful to absorb in a sense, because you can even if you haven't personally experienced what that person went through, you can connect through a person's story. I remember in the beginning, it's like, okay, hysteria, like that was forever ago, you know? And then right. then <laughs> you get into, it's like, wait a minute, this is all yeah. still happening in yeah. today's day and age. Totally. Yeah. That was definitely the same feeling that I had where when I started, it felt like these stories were of, of women symptoms being kind of dismissed as all in their head. I I kind of attributed that to just like the general tendency to not take women seriously and in like a range of context. And so I was really very surprised to to learn that history of hysteria and and how it sort of morphed into these other diagnoses and and really has has remained this concept that is alive and well in medicine and um yeah, is absolutely not just this sort of relic of the 19th century that <laughs> is way in the past, is, is very much sort of present. And, and even if it's not called hysteria, is very much kind of at play in a lot of these interactions in the medical system. Right. And that was the other thing that I picked up on was that there's there's many layers to it. So even going back to we don't have enough female physicians who, I guess, may be attuned to female needs, right? So there's so there's sexism in medicine. The diagnoses in women takes longer, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I think it is definitely related to, or at, at root kind of attributed to the fact that medicine has been male dominated for a very long time. That's really only started to change, um, you know, since the seventies. And, um, but I do think that at this point, the problems have really become so entrenched that, that, that they won't necessarily just be automatically corrected by getting more women as physicians and researchers. Although I, I do think that, that they can bring kind of new perspectives that are much needed. I think that, you know, I heard a lot of stories from women who had poor experiences with female physicians and, um, mm-hmm. I think I I do think that these are, you know, this is about unconscious bias. It's about what doctors learn in medical school and and sort of just 
the sort of bias in, in the medical knowledge that we have. And so female doctors are definitely not immune to that in any way. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about this unconscious bias for a little bit. So can you explain that for for the listeners to understand? Because I mean, I think what a typical experience is my doctor knows everything and they or they at least know more than I do. And so I just need to trust everything they're saying. And reading Mm -hmm. your book, it's like, no, no, because actually (laughs) they may not believe you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that was something that was very, um, not necessarily surprising, but it was, it was striking in in my conversations with women to realize how many women, even women who were very sort of highly educated and sort of the typical empowered patient, right? Like there is that real power dynamic in the doctor's office. So when an expert is saying, this, you know, I'm the expert. I went to medical school. I have my white coat, you know, Mm -hmm. um, it is very difficult to sort of push back when they're saying, you know, nothing's wrong and to really trust yourself instead of the expert. And so I, yeah, I do hope that one of the things the book can do is just sort of by providing this context and history and, and the data kind of empower people to do what is a very hard thing to do to, to sort of push back in that setting and yeah, in terms of implicit bias, I think there there is a growing recognition within medicine and, and lots of research that shows that there are these unconscious biases that exist, not just related to gender, but around race and class and body weight and trans state status and sexual orientation. And um, these are biases that you know, aren't necessarily and usually aren't rooted in, you know, consciously held prejudice. Um, It's not that people, doctors are intending to treat their patients differently. And yet we see that, that they often do. And for women, I think my argument is that they (laughs) are particularly impacted, especially by this tendency to just not believe their reports of their symptoms and to really kind of treat them as, as, either exaggerated or all in your head or, or normal. I think that's another sort of big way that women's symptoms get, get dismissed is by just sort of normalizing them as sort of a expected consequence of, of being a woman, you know, (laughs) whether it's menstrual cramps or menopause or just like being a new mom, there's this tendency to kind of just overlook symptoms and, and treat them as, um, just a normal part of, of life. Yeah, I remember reading in the book, it was either like, oh, you must be stressed, take a bubble bath or just breathe deeply. Yeah. Or you must, this must be psychological, right? Like those, uh-huh. those were kind of like, because you, you cover several, I mean, just naming a few heart disease, hypothyroidism, fibromyalgia. I'm drawing a blank on the <laughs> endometriosis, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> but like through, there's some kind of congruencies through them that it seems to kind of go back to denial that women's pain is real Mm -hmm. and that if they can't find like that specific, easy to diagnose symptom, then this is all in your head or Mm -hmm. you're probably just stressed out. I mean, would that say that was a theme throughout several of your stories? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, yeah, I think we just have a medical system where that sort of default to seeing if there, if there isn't a readily evident explanation for the symptoms, I think doctors have just kind of been taught generation by generation that they can attribute it to the unconscious mind and, and, and just kind of put it in this wastebasket of, of the psychological. And I think that that, I mean, it's more, I think that really hurts patients of both genders, I think. And I think it's sort of an issue that we should sort of correct within medicine, just, you know, regardless of the, the sexism inherent in it. Cause I think it's a sort of date, clearly a very dangerous concept. If, if you know, you, if you can just sort of blame anything, any symptom on, on the mind, if you don't have an explanation, that's, that's a really 
easy way to have a lot of diagnostic errors. And I think that concept particularly impacts women for sort of these historical reasons that I go into in the book and the, and just the fact that women have sort of been the typical considered the typical patients with psychogenic symptoms for a really long time. And the other thing I talk about a lot in the book is how how the lack of knowledge about women's health and that's sort of the result of of not including women in clinical studies for many decades and neglecting conditions that disproportionately affect them, like endometriosis or vulvodynia, fibromyalgia, all of these these knowledge gaps sort of contribute to that stereotype that women's symptoms are all in their heads. Because if women go to a doctor and report a symptom and the doctor doesn't have an explanation for it, and you have this concept that allows them to just say, oh, it's all in your head, that sort of becomes this really self-fulfilling prophecy where that that not, lack of knowledge perpetuates the stereotype that women are hysterical. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just brings up an interesting question, like what are, what are we supposed to do, right? So if in our, we're feeling something is not right in our, in our bodies and that we need, we need help or medical attention. So we've, we've got to go and see a doctor, right? But like you had explained in several cases in the book where it could be there's a delayed in, di in, a, in an accurate diagnosis and multiple, multiple, multiple visits, that that's just, that may be the case for some women. I mean, is that like the best that we can offer for listeners right now is what to do? Just kind of just keep, keep being your own advocate? Yeah. I mean, this, this has been a hard question for me because I, you know, I, I don't want to put this sort of onus on women to become these super empowered <laughs> patients. And I don't want to imply that the problem can just be solved by women advocating for themselves. But on an individual level, I do think that that's often what's needed, sadly, and, and it shouldn't be that way. But certainly, I hope that women do feel more empowered if, if you know, as I said, if, if they don't, and they're feeling that sort of understandable tendency to say, okay, well, the doctor said nothing's wrong. It must be nothing's wrong. Um, to, yeah, absolutely not, not accept that and to go get a second opinion or a third or a fourth or however many it takes. The other reason I think it, it's so difficult and I talk a bit in the book about there's just so many of these catch 22s where, you know, you have to, you sort of have to advocate for yourself and yet you don't want to come across as being that, you know, demanding, difficult patient, or, you know, you have to get doctors to understand that your pain is really severe. So the only way you can do that is by, you know, showing that. Mm -hmm. But if you're too emotional, then you'll be seen as hysterical. But if you're super stoic about it, then, well, nothing's really wrong. So there are just so many catch 22s that I think do make it very hard for, for individual women to kind of get what they need from the medical system. So I think, you know, the, the real answer is, is we need, you know, this system wide <laughs> change from the, from what we're teaching in medical schools to the sort of, uh, training that doctors are getting on bias. And, and also the, um, there's, there's such a need for just kind of feedback on those diagnostic errors. So this was something that was very striking to me learning from experts in diagnostic errors about the fact that one of the huge problems is that, you know, when that woman is going to three, four or five doctors before she gets properly diagnosed, those first doctors that she saw don't get the memo when she is properly diagnosed. So they sort of continue to have the impression that maybe they, you know, whatever they thought of her. And maybe it was that she was, you know, this stressed out woman that her symptoms are all in her head. Since they don't get feedback that they were wrong about that, that kind of helps perpetuate the problem and, and sort of reinforces that, that impression. So even just communication across the healthcare system so that yeah, people can do better and change. Yeah. Well, I want to go, so you had brought up I want to talk about, I guess, maybe the context of pain. And we we started discussing it a little bit where you talked about, if I understand how I was reading it in the book, is that men are expected to be stoic. And so they're 
more likely to be believed that if they say they're having pain, but they are stoic about it, they're more likely to believe and get the pain medication they need. Whereas for women, we, if we are stoic, then it's like, oh, you're fine. If you were in pain, you'd be more emotional. Mm -hmm. But then if we share, it's like the perfect amount of emotion. So they'll trust (laughs) us that there is pain that needs to be treated. And then I would add the layer onto that, um, that there's a disparity even among women based on race. You had a story in there about Jackie who like the doctors didn't believe she had lupus and thought she was seeking drugs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can yep. you share more about just this? Like, how would you sum up this pain dynamic and the intersections of race and gender? Yeah. Well, I think that was, that was a great summary. <laughs> of, actually. Yeah. It's, I think it, it, especially with pain, it seems to be so this interesting dynamic where the sort of stereotypes or expectations that we hold for men really sort of somehow impact women a lot. So because, as you said, because men are expected to be sort of stoic, if they are stoic, you know, then that's just what's what they're expected to be. And so they're, that's, that doesn't disqualify them from being really in pain. And then if, if they weren't stoic, you know, then it would be like, oh, well then something must really be the matter. You know, if, if this guy is crying, like it must be the worst pain imaginable. And, but yet somehow this sort of leads to this contrasting stereotype that women, I don't know, I mean, are, are exaggerate their pain when in fact you could just argue that like because women are sort of more permitted in our culture to express emotion and express pain that you know their reports of pain should just be treated as you know more accurate reports and just taken <laughs> at mm-hmm. face value but yeah what seems to happen is that that these stereotypes sort of act as are treated as if they're on a seesaw where if we're, we're expecting that men are like under reporting their pain, we somehow expect that women are over reporting their pain. And yeah, when, when we kind of bring in race here, I think we see that I think for white women and maybe more privileged women in, in a lot of degrees, um, a lot across a lot of factors would be treated sort of as if their pain was more emotional or, you know, attributed to anxiety or depression. Whereas women of color and black women in particular, who are very much stereotyped as, as drug seekers in the medical system, um, are often treated as if they're just, you know, making up their pain entirely and are malingerers either for painkillers or maybe for, you know, disability or insurance benefits. And again, there are so many kind of catch 22s here where, you know, the, if, if you're in pain and and somebody's not believing the pain, you know, you kind of <laughs> have no choice but to keep insisting that you're in pain. Um, and, and yet that's often treated, you know, as, you know, then you just kind of look even more hysterical or you look more like a drug seeker. So it's once that kind of determination has been made that, that your pain is not real, it becomes really hard to kind of get back your, authority as, as a reliable reporter, right? Once that's lost, it's kind of impossible then to get back. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it was in Jackie's story too, where she was like, she got her care team. And if she did have an issue where she had to go to the emergency room, she would only go if she could first guarantee that her doctor who knew her case and history would be there. So basically they wouldn't keep screwing it up for her. And then was she also the one who reluctantly made sure they knew that she had a PhD too, because she, on the one hand, ethically hated that. But on the other hand, she got different care the second they knew that she was smart, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was pretty amazing. She, she sort of just like accidentally mentioned it. She was just sort of lost her temper at this doctor and was like, why aren't you giving me the pain meds that I'm supposed to be getting? And, you know, I, I don't want to be here. I'm supposed to give you a a presentation and like <laughs> mentioned that she was a professor and and that sort of flipped the switch and mm-hmm. she suddenly was getting treated very differently. 
There was also an interesting disparity kind of shifting gears here, but it had to do with hypothyroidism and how women were treated if they were trying to get pregnant or not trying to get pregnant and kind of like, you're, you're screwed if you're not trying to have a baby. It was that the gist of it. So tell, tell us more about that. Yeah, that was, that was frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, I didn't know any of, of this, but there's just so much kind of controversy over hypothyroidism and the, you know, the different tests that are done to, to gauge thyroid health. And, um, a lot of women get told, you know, if, if their, their levels are, you know, in the normal range, even though the sort of normal range is subject to a lot of kind of professional disagreement, but for a lot of doctors who kind of stick to the, to this kind of strict by, by the blood work, those women will be told, oh, you know, even though, even if you have symptoms, um, suggestive of, of hypothyroidism, if you're not under this cutoff, then, then you're perfectly fine. And yet we, have sort of lowered the cutoff for women when they're trying to conceive. So if you're having the exact same symptoms, but also are complaining of, you know, trying to get pregnant and being unable to, then doctors will say, okay, well, let's look at your thyroid and, oh yeah, maybe you should get treated. (laughs) So yeah, I think it's a, a very clear case of sort of bringing up what, you know, what we value women for and when we consider their symptoms and and their problems to be a problem, you know, when they're just symptoms that are, you know, affecting a woman's quality of life, apparently they're, they're not worthy of, of being treated very seriously. Yeah. Because I mean, in that case, you couldn't even not, this is no justification what I'm about to say, but you can't even (laughs) use it. And it's the idea of, oh, well, it might harm the fetus. So here's the medication because you're talking about trying to conceive, not, so it's, it, you'd almost be better off being like, even if you're not like, but I'm trying to get pregnant and then you might get the medicine you want. Right. (laughs) (laughs) That's messed up. Yeah. And so a lot of that, I believe in that story, there was like, just like a lot of disagreement among like it can take forever to come up with new standards and agreement among all the educated professionals. Cause I mean, medicine does need to be evidence-based. I get that, but that's a lot of where the delays come from. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I think in, in the thyroid case, it's definitely sort of a, a divide between sort of this attachment to evidence-based standards that really doesn't even take into account at all the patient's own reports of their symptoms and just sort of relies on this single test, even though there are actually other tests that you could sort of do to get a fuller picture of thyroid function. And you could take into account the patient's reports of their symptoms, um, which, you know, I think, yeah, I think absolutely evidence-based medicine is important, but I think we can certainly make mistakes by, by thinking that, that, that means we can reduce everything to, to, you know, a single number instead of kind of seeing the patient as, as a whole. So what can you tell me about what you discovered with heart disease and the disparities in between men and women? Yeah. Heart disease is, is a pretty compelling example. Um, in part, just because it's, it's one of the diseases that where we have the most research over the past 25 years on real sex gender differences in in the disease itself. And so for the first 35 years that we were studying heart disease, we were almost entirely studying it in in men. Um, And that was, you know, for some understandable reasons that, you know, men tended to get the disease earlier than women. And so you had, you know, middle-aged men who were dying of heart disease and it was, you know, treated as, as a real emergency. And, um, a lot of research was devoted to kind of figuring out what was happening and and ways to prevent it. And it wasn't really until the eighties and nineties that researchers started to say, okay, well, women get heart disease too. (laughs) Uh, it's the leading killer of women in the U S they do tend to get it later. And, and, 
So for most of our lives, men have a higher risk of the disease. And then after menopause, those, those risks for men and women start to equalize. And so in the past 25 years, as we started to really study heart disease in women, we've seen that there are these really key differences where women are more likely to have what's called atypical symptoms. So instead of just the sort of classic Hollywood heart attack where, you know, you have your chest pain and maybe pain in your arm, women are more likely to have nausea and fatigue, jaw pain, neck pain. And to this day, there's, there's a sort of lack of enough, lack of awareness about that, both among women and the public and, and among healthcare providers. And we've also started to see that this research has shown that there's a sort of entirely new sort of female pattern heart disease that affects kind of the, the smaller arteries of the heart and is not detectable by angiogram. So really you can, you can be having chest pain and, and go to the R and go through the whole sort of protocol to detect heart disease and not have that sort of female pattern heart disease detected. And, and I think there's also heart disease is also an area where we have a lot of evidence that women are undertreated and underdiagnosed and again, are sort of dismissed in the way that they are across a, a, realm, a range of diseases where women will often go in and be having chest pain or other heart attack symptoms and be told, you know, it's just anxiety or, um, you know, you're having a panic attack um, and just be sent home. So one amazing statistic is that women under 55 are seven times more likely than the average patient to be sent home from the ER in the middle of having a heart attack. Whoa. Yeah. Like you're, you're exactly where you need to be when it's happening. I'm like, nope, you're yeah. fine. Go home. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, I think it's a heart disease is a good example also of a disease where the fact that it's sort of been stereotyped as a male disease in our sort of image of the typical heart attack patient is, is male, that really impacts women. And, you know, you, I, there are stories in the book of women who are being ha- mid heart attack being told, you know, you couldn't possibly be having a heart attack because you're, you know, a younger middle-aged woman. But I think that happens in, in a lot of diseases. So something like I talk a little bit about cluster headaches, which is also much more common in men, but also in autism or ADHD. There are these diseases that get stereotyped as male diseases, and it becomes so hard for women who have those diseases to get recognized. Because it's, you're, you don't have a penis, you can't get that disease, basically. (laughs) Basically, it's that. And it's also that a lot of our research has then been done on, on men. And so like in the heart a disease example, then our sort of understanding of the symptoms is is based on this male model, and and we're only just learning that women's symptoms might be different, and the the expression of the d- disease may be different. But all of that knowledge has just kind of come about in the last twenty five years, and a lot of it, a lot of the knowledge that we do have from that research has yet to be incorporated into medical education because there's there's such a long lag time for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's so much to know. It continues to grow. I got to imagine it's not, I got to imagine it's not easy. And yet at the same time, I, you know, what, what just constantly bothers me about this whole idea, to me, it goes back to the issue of trust. Like Mm -hmm. I I know for sure I'm not a doctor (laughs) and (laughs) I feel wise in my body. I feel that there's a certain amount of, I mean, I might be tired on any given day with a lack of sleep the night before, but it makes sense. And when I catch up on my sleep, I generally feel better. I know when I'm starting to feel sick, just sort of the basic, typical, how you can be aware that things are all right. And if something were to be different, I would be able to note that. And I would probably initially think, oh, maybe it'll pass and maybe delay kind of going to see someone about it. But I think if it persisted, I would be like, okay, it's time to go to a doctor. It's time to get something checked out. And so if you're sort of self-delaying and then you go in and start going and at that point I'd be like, oh, great, they're going to figure it out. I trust them 100%. 
<laughs> and what I felt like in reading your book was that kind of slow down, <laughs> that <laughs> that that might not necessarily be the case, you know, based on, like you said, the implicit bias and just this idea that you actually might be dealing with something that is more rare in a woman doesn't mean that it can't happen. So to me, I feel like the overall message that I got was if you're noticing something that feels off for your typical normal to keep mm-hmm. focusing trust in that, regardless of what you're hearing from your doctors. Yes, absolutely. I, I 100% agree. Yeah. And I, I think, as you said, I think that there, a lot of us do have that expectation that, that if something were wrong and, and, you know, we expect that we could tell when something was wrong and would eventually seek care that, that we would be trusted. And I think it, it was, especially for sort of younger women, millennial women like me who have sort of grown up to sort of feel entitled to a degree of authority in the world, having these encounters in, in the medical system where their own testimonies about their bodies were just not being listened to at all was really shocking, you know, to really sort of, it was surprising and it was disappointing. And, um, I think sort of at first very destabilizing to be in that situation, um, and not really know why, but sense that, you know, you, you just weren't being trusted as, as that reliable reporter. And, um, I mean, I, I talk about in the book, I heard from multiple women who eventually took to bringing their husbands or fathers or sons with them because they sort of sensed that that's what they needed. And, you know, even, even worse found that they, they were treated differently and and were taken more seriously when they had a man who was sort of corroborating what they were saying. Mm. I mean, do what you got to do, I guess, but that's, right. <laughs> that's some shit right there. <laughs> right. Right. Well, let's shift gears a bit and talk about size discrimination in medicine. Yeah. I certainly know it's prevalent just from my role in counseling clients. And it's, you know, it's, I feel like with, it's with a sense of desperation that I'm like, are there any health at every size physicians in the DC area? And there's literally one who I love collaborating with, but schedules don't always accommodate or, you know, things like that. And it, it, it becomes really hard. You know, I've heard stories of clients, I mean, you know, recovered from an eating disorder and is in for the gynecologist and just, I mean, you're already right in this vulnerable position and the exam is over and, you know, the doctor's leaving you to go and change. And well, I hope to see less of you next year, Gosh, (laughs) you know, and like she, and it, you know, it was a referral from a physician that we were working together with. So there was this whole like processing of the experience and then also how to do a better job at setting boundaries. So we, you know, worked on a letter that she could write to the practice explaining why she wasn't going to come back and what happened and tried to be professional in the sense of like, if I can help at least one other person, but you need to educate yourselves about Mm-hmm. you know, weight stigma and I guess kindness <laughs> in and of itself, and then notified the referring physician about what happened just for consideration for future referral. So I feel like because she had support, we were able to take action, but you talk about this in your book. So what, what would you like to say about weight stigma in medicine? I think it's just so important for, for women to realize that, I mean, I think you know, all of us know that, that weight bias is prevalent in our culture everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so it's not surprising that we would find it in medicine for sure. But, you know, it's true that, that women are face more discrimination for being overweight than men in a range of realms. And that is also true in medicine. So, Met, women are more likely to be told to lose weight by healthcare providers. You know, that's based on surveys of patients. And also when you, you know, do experiments asking doctors, you know, would you advise weight loss for this patient if it's a uh, man versus a woman, there's, there's a, there's a difference, um, which is just very ironic considering that women are 
actually more likely than men to be overweight or obese and perfectly metabolically healthy. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we know that we, we shouldn't be judging anybody by their, their, anybody's health by their weight, but especially women are sort of mislabeled when we sort of just make assumptions. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, we live in this culture where women are getting messages from everywhere to be thinner. And so it's, it was shocking to me to actually, to, to realize just how, how prevalent this is, how doctors just are continually lecturing women <laughs> about losing weight, especially in this, in this world where, you know, at best that's a sort of redundant advice, right? Like <laughs> as if somebody who is, is overweight, doesn't know that, isn't kind of told that by, by everybody everywhere, you know? And yeah, the sort of the, the lack of concern about eating disorders in this was, was really kind of shocking to me that the, there's just like, seems to be no sort of awareness that that's a real risk that when you're telling somebody to lose weight and if they have a predis- predisposition for an eating disorder, that that could trigger that and that, you know, women obviously are at higher risk for eating disorders. There's just such a lack of awareness about but about all these things. And so I, I think I just I hope that women do realize that 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 bias is there, the the weight bias and also the sort of disproportionate impact on women. And so again, just feel really empowered to not put up with it and to really seek healthcare providers who, um, treat them as, as a patient and not as just, you know, a a number on a scale. But as you said, it it is obviously so difficult to find those providers because they're few and far between. Yeah. And I think one possible answer, I mean, besides further education, but also getting higher weight physicians into doing practice, you know? So it's, I think that there's a benefit to just while we, you know, take excruciating long time to shift our culture, that part of, part of that shift is being able to find relationships that you can trust and rely on and set boundaries with respect to the type of care you want to receive the -hmm. best you can. And certainly even if you feel drawn to avoiding the doctor, that that avoidance isn't going to help you. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, the avoidance is, is such a huge problem for, I feel like for women of, you know, of lots of sizes. I mean, you see surveys that show that even, you know, quote unquote, normal weight women delay going to the doctors if they perceive themselves as being overweight. And of course, in this culture where we have ridiculous standards, many people perceive themselves as being overweight. And yeah, delay seeking care for preventative care and for even for, you know, acute problems in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. I think, I think I have these numbers right in the book. You said women face discrimination at 13 pounds overweight and then compared to men the discrimination for men starts around 68 pounds overweight. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. (laughs) That's a big gap. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there should be, like you said, and we agree, no discrimination, you know, ever based on anything, but specific to size discrimination and looking at the gender gap differences that for women, it's like, okay, you get this much allowance and now all of a sudden your body is a problem. Right. And men get a much greater allowance. Right, right. Yeah, the other striking study was, it was, um, I think, a 2016 study that showed that a third of American women had been advised to lose weight by a doctor, and nearly half had said that they'd somewhat commonly canceled or delayed an appointment because they wanted to drop a few pounds first. And one of the amazing things about that study was that it was also, this was like in the context of heart disease risk factors and um, found that I think a majority of the women had risk factors for heart disease, but only 16% had actually been informed of that. So basically, instead of telling women, you know, or testing women and then informing them, you know, you have high blood pressure or, you know, you have a family history, so we should keep an eye on this. 
doctors are basically just saying lose weight as if that would fix all their problems. And that's just not, I mean, weight is not an independent risk factor for heart disease. And Mm -hmm. so (laughs) instead of informing women about these actual risk factors that they had, they were telling them to lose weight, which had the effect of, of course, of women just not going to the doctor and not getting their Mm -hmm. heart checkups. And presumably for thinner women, probably assuming that they, you know, didn't have to worry about anything, even if they maybe had um, risk factors for heart disease that they should actually be concerned about, but kind of were given the message that like, oh, well, you're thin, so... Everything's nope. fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> so yeah, it really, I think it hurts all of us of all, of all sizes that there's this kind of tendency to fixate on women's weight as sort of a proxy for their their health instead of the, you know the actual science here. Mm-hmm. And what would be some of the examples of when doctors blame overweight women's symptoms on the weight alone? And it's just kind of like sprained ankle, lose weight. Blood clot in the lungs, lose weight. <laughs> but that that can lead to diagnostic delays that can be really dangerous. Yeah, I mean, super dangerous. I think, I think you know, as Rebecca's story that I talked about in the book and also in this Cosmopolitan piece really showed, you know, there's this tendency for doctors to kind of treat symptoms in fat patients, overweight patients, as if they're perfectly normal. Um, whereas those same symptoms, if, if they were happening in a thinner patient would be cause for huge concern. So Rebecca was increasingly having trouble breathing, you know, it was getting worse. And yet that was sort of treated as this expected consequence of, of being at her size. And I think, you know, I, I mean, I heard so many stories. So you had heard from another woman who was suddenly having heart palpitations and went to the ER and she wasn't taken seriously until the doctors learned that she was training for a marathon. And then suddenly she was getting treatment and testing and, um, they they had clearly just kind of assumed that they could tell by looking at her that she was inactive. And I think the other sort of problem dynamic that plays out here is that healthcare providers are really sort of looking at at weight as this sort of problem to be fixed and not and forgetting that there are actually, you know, underlying diseases that cause weight gain or weight loss as a symptom. So I heard from one woman who had suddenly lost a lot of weight in a short amount of time unintentionally. It turned out that she had Lyme disease and some co-infections, but she was just congratulated by her doctor because he was like, "Oh, you're you look great at like 126 pounds." Mm. <laughs> and she was severely sick. And then on the flip side, I heard from a woman who had all the symptoms of celiac disease and and was asking if potentially that could be it and was told, you know, point blank that she was too fat to be celiac and wasn't, (laughs) and, and wasn't even given the test for it because it was just assumed that she couldn't possibly be because of her size. Oh my gosh. I have no words. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about something more cheerful? Um, (laughs) I guess... (laughs) I guess as we're wrapping up and everything, I mean, it was really has been an enlightening conversation. Like I said, I loved reading your book. I loved hearing about the history. I loved hearing about people's stories that are, were really outside of my own experience in my personal life or in my family's life. Some of it, you know, being a registered dietitian, I could relate to like clinically and working with clients, especially a lot of stuff around fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and just just the despair and the frustrations with being able to get good care and certainly the weight stigma, um, you know, that folks experience. But, you know, I know we kind of hash out early on, but maybe to reiterate, like, we know avoiding going to the doctor is not an option. So like, what would be our little checklist of things like, and I'll get us started with the first one and then let you rip on the rest. But like, I think first is just, reading the book and being aware that there is a disparity and that it is likely that women get inadequate medical care compared to men. And it's a problem that we have to face. And so be aware about it and accept it. But then what? Like, what are we supposed to do? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think 
as we've said, just really kind of trust yourself and, you know, I, I think try to communicate as clearly as possible. Although again, I do think there are these catch 22s that make it hard, but really just sort of do your best to insist that you do know what's normal for your own body. You know, whatever your body looks like, you are the one who lives in it every day and should be trusted by healthcare providers to be able to note a change and, and, uh, and should insist that, that you, your reports of your symptoms be trusted. And if, if you are encountering a healthcare provider who clearly seems to not be trusting you or not listening, I would, I would say, you know, just if you have the the ability and the means to switch doctors to just do that as soon as you sort of sense that that disrespect because i think it's you know you don't want to you know especially when you're sick and you're you don't know why you're sick it's a very stressful time when you're looking for a diagnosis and so to be sort of fighting for the care that you need or just for somebody to listen to you is not you know, that's a stress that you don't want to put on yourself in that moment. So to the extent that you can sort of switch doctors, get a second opinion right away, I think that that would be helpful. Um, and we, we've talked about, you know, bringing, bringing a husband or a, a male partner, I think that can be helpful. But even if it's not like a man, I do think that having somebody with you in the doctor's office is, is really helpful for anybody. I think that that's, you know, it's, it's a time when you're probably stressed. You have like a lot of information to get across information to receive. And I think it can be helpful just to have somebody who's like taking notes or reminding you of what you wanted to get across. And, you know, especially these days when you have like 12 minutes or whatever it is, (laughs) it's, I think, you know, it's, you want to make the most of that time. And so it can be helpful to have, have an ally in that context. Yes. Bring an advocate who can, if there's two of you saying, hey, this ain't right, maybe you'll have better luck. (laughs) Yeah. Good. (laughs) Well, the book Doing Harm, it's available everywhere. And how about if folks want to get in touch with you or follow you on social media, how can can they uh, get to know you better? Yeah. um, You can follow me on Twitter at Maya Dusenberry. You can also check out more about the book um, and there are links to the Amazon and other retailer links on my website, which is mayadusenberry.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And that's a wrap on today's show. Let's continue the conversation on Facebook. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and click to join. And if you can contribute to the production costs for the 2018 podcast season, visit gofundme.com slash body kindness. We love ratings and reviews. Please do that. And don't forget to let your friends know that body kindness is one of your can't miss podcasts. If you have questions, comments, or guest recommendations, shoot me an email, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. 